It's 1987, and two men born in the same year want a new job. Neil Kinnock hopes to become Prime Minister in the general election, and Joe Biden wants to be the next US President. Both men make a speech from the heart. Neil Kinnock speaks in Llandidno. Why am I the first Kinnock in a thousand generations? To be able to get the university. In the United States, Senator Joe Biden speaks in Iowa. Is it because I'm the first Biden in a thousand generations to get a college and a graduate degree? Hmm, a similar theme. But any more similarities between the speeches? Why is Glennis the first woman in her family in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Why is it that my wife is sitting out there in the audience is the first in her family to ever go to college. Was it because they were weak? Those people who could wait, work eight hours underground and then come up and play football? Is it because they didn't work hard? My ancestors who worked in the coal mines in Northeast Pennsylvania and come up after 12 hours and play football for four hours? It was because there was no platform upon which they could stand. It's because they didn't have a platform upon which to stand. Joe Biden was accused of plagiarizing Neil Kinnock. I did not say to paraphrase Neil Kinnock. I should have, but I was talking about me. And he dropped out of the race, never succeeding Ronald Reagan. But I'm a big boy. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. As for Neil Kinnock, the speech was widely praised, but he never got a replace. Margaret Thatcher. It's a great story, and if you believe the polls, it'll be third time lucky for Joe Biden. We'll find out next month. Recently, I caught up with Neil Kinnock to recall the events of 1987. When you put those two extracts from your speech and Joe Biden's speech together, you have to wonder how he ever thought he'd get away with it. Usually, he, when he'd used the speech many times, he did acknowledge the origin. Uh, as Neil Kinnock said, or as Kinnock said. And uh, th this could, of course, lead to difficulties because he did a, a corn bake in Iowa. And after he'd spoken and got a very, very good reception from this crowd of thousands, an old farmer came up to him in his dungarees. He said, Senator, that was mighty fine speech, mighty fine speech. Uh, but I got a question. What's that, said Joe? Uh, I I didn't know that Kennex was in the politics, and I certainly didn't know he was a labor man. And this old guy had confused me with a baseball player from the 1930s. If that had happened today, it would all be over social media in, in seconds. So, what, what was your reaction when you, when you first heard this had happened? It was amusement, really. And uh, I suppose it tickled my vanity a bit as well, but I didn't give it much thought. And then there was the great fuss about Joe having to drop out of the presidential nominations race. And uh, when he came to see me about six or eight months later, uh, we had a good laugh about it actually, um, because he's a very pleasant guy. It uh, doesn't take himself too seriously though he's serious about the world. And uh, we thought it was quite a hoot. In addition, uh, Joe said that the fact that he'd used my words had saved his life. How so? Well, uh, when he came off the campaign trail, because he was obliged to retire, really, uh, he went to see the doctor about these he headaches he'd been having for months and just giving himself, you know, pills to try and get rid of the headache. And the doctor took one look at him, examined him, said, sit there, Joe, because you're going straight to hospital. And a couple of hours later, he was in, on the operating table uh, having a very large benign tu tumor removed from his brain. So Joe reckons that uh, this set of events actually saved his life. Let's talk about this, your speech itself, though. Um, that one's in a, the first Kinnock in a Thousand Generations you made. 
Where did that come from? Were you, were you speaking off the cuff? Was it prepared? What, what was it? I, I was speaking off the cuff. I, I was making a speech in Sandidno, and I once said to Joe, look, uh, if you speak in future and use my speeches, you have to say, as Neil Kinnock said, in Sandidno. And he balked at that, I have to tell you. But um, it was the Welsh Labour Conference in Sandidno right at the beginning of the 1987 general election. And I was making a speech, which, as usual, I'd written overnight. And the audience were uh, very attentive, quite gripped, but I didn't think I really ignited them. So I, I left what I'd written all together and just reflected on our origins and whether it was the deficiencies of our forebears that had caused them to have no advantages, no chances in life, or was it the system? And that's how I illustrated it. And the audience became electric. And it is considered, I think, by, by all parties, whatever your political persuasion, to be one of the greatest speeches. Um, of course, you and Joe Biden, you met years later. Uh, what was that like? In 2007, uh, I went to Washington uh, as chairman of the British Council. So I notified Joe, told him I'd like to see him, and instantly got an invitation to his Senate office. And when I got there, he greeted me at the door, stood there, put his arm around me and said, uh, folks, come here, come here. So his staff came from the various parts of his offices and sort of lined up. And he said, folks, I want you to make Meet my greatest speechwriter, Neil Kinnock. And <laughs> we all laughed. It was, um, it was such a great reflection on the man's uh, humanity and his willingness to have a laugh at his own expense. On Inauguration Day in January, he'll be 78. I think that's also your age. So if age is no barrier and he can become the senior, most senior, most powerful man in the world, do you fancy another crack at Downing Street? <laughs> Certainly not. I've got the T-shirt with all the scars on it. Um, no, I don't. But, of course, uh, Joe is very fit, uh, very self-possessed. And one of the things about being president of the United States is that you get quite a lot of professional assistance. So it means that while his decision-making capacity and his articulation and his ability to think and identify issues is as sharp as it ever was, uh, then uh, when he needs heavy lifting, uh, he can call upon a large number of other people. We haven't seen you for a while, and a lot has changed in the world right now. You've got the coronavirus, you've got Brexit, you've got the new Labour Party leader. What is, what's your assessment of everything that's going on right now? I spend my life, like I think most people do, in a mixture of bemusement, puzzlement, bewilderment, and absolute rage. I, it's a wonder our television has survived because Glennis shares so many of my views and commitments. Lucky you haven't smashed your telly because you can watch the new series of Spitting Image. That's back. Um, <laughs> what, what was that like to be on? I mean, it's a new era now, but what was it like to be lampooned by those puppets? Well, yeah, it was fine for me. Uh, in fact, amongst politicians of the day, it was much worse not to be on and overlooked than to be on and the focus of attention. So I guess uh, they were compensating factors. What I did have reservations about was on behalf of my children. They were both in the local comprehensive at the time. And of course, Monday mornings for them, after spitting image went out on Sunday night, could be absolute purgatory. But they dealt with it because they're strong kids. But, oh, they, they were strong kids. They're very much not kids now. Um, but in any case, they said that my puppet was an improvement on the real thing. So I, I think that showed a, a sense of perspective 
and in his strength on their part. Lord Kinnock, Neil Kinnock, thank you so much for joining us here on Sharp End. Thank you.